When will the dictatorship of the proletariat end? Never. No, it did end. 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. Theoretically. Yeah, they're, they're not. They're, what happens is, once people get the power, they never give it up. The people are never ready. And they form their own little class of leaders of the Communist Party. But they would get their revenge. What treaty did Germany force the new Bolshevik government to sign, giving Germany a victory? Um, rest the toss. What is that a picture of in the corner? That's an American. Oh, I got it wrong. What building this is? That is the Reichstag. The German parliamentary building, that's in Berlin. And that's when the Soviets took it in April of 1945. They got the revenge, so to speak, for Brest-Litovsk. And wow, they beat the Germans. Uh-oh, they're scary. Yes. Hmm? Good. good. I didn't hear it, but good. And you'll notice that flag, same as that flag, that is the very same flag, the exact flag. We reviewed the treaty really quick. Who is it good really, for? Really the treaty, the treaty of Brest Litovsk. That treaty was a really supported or gave the Germans everything they wanted. Okay, from the Russians. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And just totally humiliated the Russians. And when they did the Versailles, the Western Allies were like, "Look how bad they were to the Russians. We just about us being bad to the Germans okay. and the Austrians and the Hungarians <laughs> and the Turks and the Bulgarians." Why does that start for like Time is fading. Okay, so now the U.S. is in the war. Oh, by the way, we're setting the stage for the old uh, Cold War. It's coming fast. Well, mobilization. The United States must gear their entire economy for war. And the big thing is we must pay for it. Financing the war will be the number one most important thing. Modern war, you need to organize your entire financial system. And the first thing is progressive income tax. Remember the 16th Amendment now allows for that. We're back from 1913. Progressive means what people pay higher percentage in taxes. Mm -hmm. Higher your income, eventually the tax rates will go up to 76%. Oh. Nobody pays 70% of their, 6% of their income. They're called marginal income taxes. And I'll tell you, I'll show exactly how it works when we get to the New Deal. But, Progressive taxation, it probably was not high enough. So the and the country had to borrow a lot of money, therefore bonds. And liberty bonds, yeah, have you heard of savings bonds? Those came out of the liberty bonds and war bonds, World War One and Two. And that's basically trying to get individuals to loan the government money. And here it's justifying it by saying, after a Zeppelin raid in London, prevent this in New York. So how much was the tax station rate? Up to 76%. And the problem was, we probably relied too much on bonds, combined with a shortage of all these consumer goods. Inflation in 1918 alone was 100%. And it would be even greater in 1919, the year after the war. So think about prices doubling. And wages did not keep up, not even close. Wages went up, but not near enough to afford this. During the war, workers sacrificed. After the war, it's going to be a lot different. They're going to demand a higher pay. So this is a big deal, this inflation. The U.S. did a lot better job in World War II with taxes, bonds, and controlling prices. A lot better. But got to remember, this is still pretty new. And another thing. What about industry? A group of boards were created by Congress. War boards, they called it, where the government's going to take over the economy. And people soon dubbed this war socialism. The government controlled the economy. I mean, they controlled production. They, heck, they controlled who produced what and how much. They even tried to control wages. This massive apparatus created from scratch. The most important, the War Industries Board, the WIB. We're getting soon to the era of acronyms. We get to the New Deal, it'll be an alphabet soup. Bernard Baruch, who is a financier, Wilson put him in charge, thinking a financier is an investment banker, 
and he was good at marshalling all the different resources, not just one industry. So the thought was he could set up a board to control production of every industry, from oil production to automobiles to planes, steel, control everything, how much they produce, what they produce, everything. And for the first year, I mean, it really did seem like it was working. It had this aura that it was really successful. And what a great system, the centralized control. By 1918, it was proven to be a disaster. Companies refused to cooperate. Best example would be Ford. Henry Ford was making a lot of money, making his Model Ts. He didn't want to quit making Model Ts. He had money to make. So he refused to follow the war industry's board. Do you arrest Henry Ford? He did the same thing in World War II. He had money to make. And so that's a problem. And hmm, the Nazis were buying four as well in 1944. He kept a subsidiary there. Henry Ford's an interesting man. We'll talk more about him. But this kind of centralized control, they pick favorites. Nobody really controlled it. It was evenly handled. It was a disaster. He would eventually resign. Disgrace is not quite the right word, but it kind of had this uh, scurry off in the middle of the night. The U.S. did not start producing large numbers of munitions and uh, equipment until January of 1919. Yeah, the war's been over for three months. It was a disaster. Most of American equipment was purchased from France and Britain, which is kind of ironic considering how much money U.S. banks are loaning them at this time. And so this did not work. Even though Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, is going to have a good memory of this. Another one would be the Food Administration. This was very successful. Hoover Heaver was in charge. And Heaver would become probably the most accomplished member of the cabinet. He would be so popular. Well, yes. Yeah. Hoover. Hoover Heber. And I don't know why I call him Hoover Heber, but I do. I mean, this guy, he was the classic definition of the 1920s. It'll be this kind of idea of the self made man. He was orphaned at a very young age, but would become a very accomplished administrator. And he came out with the most stellar reputation of anybody from World War I. He organized food. Uh, not only production of food on farms and get into the markets, but one of his great innovations, it was brilliant, this idea that we're all sacrificing together. So grow a victory garden, <laughs> grow vegetables at home, plant, plant um, hoe up your garden or your grass yards and grow vegetables. And here's Hoover and telling this diner, you know, this wealthy diner, you're going to have to sacrifice too, essentially. It was brilliant. And then here, food will win the war. Classic idea. So sacrifice here. Don't eat what you did. Accept substitutions for what you did eat. And we can win the war. And right when the war ended, the Food Administration sent millions of tons of food to Belgium. They were starving after the war. And millions of tons would be sent to Russians who were devastated by the famine caused by, a civil, by the Civil War. Or Russia. Oh, yeah, there's civil war. From World War One till 1953, between um, 70 and 80 million Russians died from natural causes. It's I the Russians don't remember that. Huh? They remember it in a different way. Like we don't want, we just want to they were, it just, it's, it's, Stalin still is by far the most popular leader Russians ever had. By far. Your number two is? Lenin. Ivan the Terrible. <laughs> so, the assumption was 200,000 soldiers would enlist. And this is a line from in New York City. And this was the first day they opened the list. The list. They got two. Did I say two hundred thousand? Yeah. I meant two million. Two million. They thought two million would enlist. In fact, they thought they were going to have to turn people away. We don't have enough camps to uh, 
to train all the troops. This was seen, at, or this the, the expectation was, we'll soon be sending forces over. Now let me ask you about volunteers. Anyone? You up? You're in. What do you suppose people thought? Even if they were kind of, okay, we can go to war. You know, I don't want me or my son or husband, you know, to go fight and die in a trench. <coughs> Any volunteers go fight and die in a trench? No. So the draft. Yeah. What's that? You get lice. All the lice you can. You can have rats. That can eat you. <laughs> oh, the rats. I know. You got one more? Okay, we got two. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> Lice is, I've actually seen that. And it brings back really bad memories. <laughs> so, here's the sheet music was really popular. And it was, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. Sheet music was really popular at that time. So, the draft. Congress would pass, not unanimously, but Congress would pass the draft. Yes. Hmm? I was already too old. And <laughs> I know it's weird. <laughs> and select these servants. They're the ones who run the draft or do the draft. In 1979, it's kind of a Cold War political gimmick, which still is with us today. We still have the select these service, and all of you young men have to register in the next year, right? <laughs> Who's anybody really close to 18 or <laughs> Some people stop a year and a half or more. It's coming. Yeah, that's a relic of the Cold War. It's kind of weird that we still have this relic of the Cold War. But. For this? So it's done. But they have you, when you're drafted or you enlist, they have you for eight years. And then once you're done, they have you for it's, 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 it depends on what you do. What you list in. But the big thing is, even if they drum you out, you, even though even if your list is done, they can still bring you back. So they don't need you. That's the certain amount. So, so they started drafting soldiers, and there was immediately anti draft. Not only comp, this was not unanimous. There are a lot of people saying this went against the American value. I mean, to force somebody to go fight in a war that they didn't want. Now, remember, this was really controversial in the Civil War. Remember the anti-draft riots in New York? And so here's a, uh, this is telling people to draft. It was a lottery. Every, the first draft call would be every birthday would get a number. And they would pick the numbers out by random. The lower the number for your birthday, the better chance you're drafted. Yes, if you're number one, you're in. You're 365. They would do this again in World War II until they just drafted everybody. And then <laughs> Vietnam, they, they finally went back to the lottery like this in 69. And by law today, unless they change the law, that's how the draft would be today. If they really say the draft. Just like random numbers? Yeah, birthdays for, for each birthday, we get a random number of one that's 365. And on that day? No, no, it'd just be. They just, they just give a number. So, like, there'd be a random number. And any number below, let's say 100, you're in. Wow. So, if you're like one, you're in. <laughs> Two, you're in. Yeah. So you said that um, they'd be given a number one through 365. Mm -hmm. What if there's one that's going to be closely done that day? What's that? So, like, say there's two people, three people want to say, maybe they're still going to be the same number. Oh, yeah, every, every person born on the day would be the same number. So, that'd be everybody born on whatever birthday got one. July. Oh, yeah, whatever day that would be. Now, here is a big anti draft ride, in, or just it was a meeting, but violently broken up by police. Who are opposed to the war. And here's another placard for against war. Almost immediately, people started coming out against the war. And Wilson, he went nuts. President Wilson, now we're just a couple months into the war, and Wilson made the big jump. Think about Wilson. Wilson didn't want war. He started trying to stay neutral. And then he decided, okay, now we have to go to war. That, like literally, once he made his mind up, we must go to war, then he thought, 
it is the most moral and just thing there is. In fact, he would argue he was with the angels. And anybody against him, therefore, there's something wrong. And he looked at it like, well, all good Americans agree with me, right? Because I'm a good American. I know what's best. So if you're against the draft, what does that mean? And not only that, that means Wilson began to look at it, there must be an enemy within. An enemy within the country that's encouraging people to go against the war. Good Americans would always agree with Wilson, so there must be something dragging them down. Which, by the way, also tells you that he doesn't think much of most people. Yeah. If they could be swayed that easily. And by the way, if there's an enemy within, so somebody within the United States who's an enemy, who would, what would they look like? I ain't an enemy. No. Well, obviously you, and who else? Anybody wearing a coat? No, who would they look like? <laughs> Oh, I Anyone with so who do we suspect? Everybody. Everybody is under suspicion now. You are. No. You're I'm bringing down judgment. Of course, now you have to just rattle me. I'd be gone. But I wouldn't go along. <laughs> so I want all of you to name names. Marjorie. Tomorrow, five names. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, Dylan. And now, what a great way to just get rid of somebody you just want to get rid of, huh? <laughs> so, nobody was more opposed to the war than a lot of more left leaning groups and socialists. In fact, William Jennings Bryan was Wilson's Secretary of State until then. He, uh, he uh, resigned. Remember Brian? Well, socialists were opposed to war. This is a socialist cartoon of the war. So you get that's war. I mean, can you see it okay? There's money down below. And so here is the big businessman. You know, this banks and business getting rich off the war while workers go die. In fact, socialists would say workers killing workers. Why are we different? Big business to labor. My good fellow, you'll be well paid for your patriotic action intending this glorious plant. You shall have all the food above the ground. I'll take only the roots. Yeah. Who dies and who gets rich? In fact, that's the thing about the draft. That's all of you should draft. Right? I, that, I'm allowed to say that because I'm old now and I'm going to drop it. Isn't that kind of the way war is? <laughs> people who won't go fight make the decisions, and the people who will fight, they're, you know, they're drunk. <laughs> oh, death, death. All the, all the problems that come with war, he'll pay for it while they get rich. And, you know, that's what they say. Are you going to fight a war so bankers get rich? Well, the most important of these socialist unions was a growing union in the early 20th century, the International Workers of the World, the IWW. Yeah, basically. And they wanted a, that's why it says one big union, but yeah, it is a little redundant. But the International Workers of the World. And basically they wanted a union for all workers together, and they believed in direct action including before the war, sometimes they would use sabotage if companies did not agree to collective bargaining. This would be the symbol they would use, the IWW cap, known as Sabo cap. Name Sabo cap. And they came out against the war. They came out against the draft. And you catch the cartoon. See it? And it's the Kaiser. And now they're claiming the IWW's with the Kaiser. Now, the IWW's against the war, period. They don't support the Germans, but in the thinking of the time, if you're not with the war effort, therefore the draft, you're a traitor. Savile Cat would never betray us, but they said they would. And so, what the search became is the real goal in total war, social unity. Everybody acting and thinking together. All of us thinking together as one people, as one group, as the mass. 
all with one common goal, to win the war. And so that is what would be pushed after the selective service to get people to accept the draft. And that's when America totally adopted the total war, to root out those who were opposed to the draft. And the number one tool, propaganda. The Creel Commission was also called the Committee of Public Information, but everybody called it after George Creel. He was a movie producer. The Creel Commission, propaganda. They would put out posters, newspaper articles. They would pin newspaper articles, put them in the newspaper, and it was hard to tell if it was real news or fake news. Not so much fake news as in propaganda, because remember, this is the influence. And they would use other. So radio wasn't around yet, but movies. So in the theater, they would produce movies under four flags. Italy, Britain, France, U.S. Or another one, America's answer to push the war. One of the most successful is they would send men out, they called them four minute men. Remember minute men for the American Revolutionary War. And they would spend four minute men out to go basically quick little speeches in workplaces and schools and parks. Why we must fight, why the war is worth it, and be vigilant for those who are who might betray our war out. And I'm looking around. <laughs> they were incredibly successful. Using the same thing when you get more technology, people become more susceptible to it. Radio and more movies by the 30s and 40s, and then TV and that kind of media by the 1970s, and today you're bombarded by it. And the more technology, the harder it is to know what is propaganda and what isn't. It's ironic. The more technology we have, the more access to information, the less confident, the least com the less confident we are, because we just have too much stuff. Yes, sir. Yeah, they have they have newsreels, which were very propaganda. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they was. It's coming. It's coming. Almost every member of the IWW Montana would be arrested for speaking out against the war. And that leads right to this. The reason why the Espionage Act happened was to shut up people about the draft, so people go willingly to the trenches. To convince people it's a sacrifice. To shame people if they disagreed with it. And to root them out. To root them out if they speak out against it. Every state in the union would pass their own espionage act for the state too. Montana would arrest nearly 200 people to hold them under the espionage act. Anybody wanna guess what town the IWW is really big in Montana? Butte, because of all the miners there. Butte had just 120, actually had 120,000 people during the war. Think about the demand for co copper because of the war. And almost all of uh, the leaders of the IWW would be arrested, and the rest shut up. By Montana. And those who weren't arrested, you had to watch your back because people are coming after you. Once you convince people that there is a real enemy and a threat, then they start looking for them themselves. The next year, a sedition act was passed. Banning all criticism of government. All criticism of government will be banned. Now, the Espionage Act implied it. You read parts of the bill. It kind of said it. Sedition Act. You criticize the government. You're, no doubt. That ended when the war ended. This state. And think about it for a second. All criticism of the government. Let's say you want to end child labor. Wait a minute. Yeah, women should vote. You're speaking out against government policy. Arrested. And a lot of suffrage, uh, leaders of the suffrage movement, arrested. Force fed. Isn't it true that if you're in the military, you can't criticize the government? Practically, yeah. So For or against. You can't you can't support the government, it can't be against the government. So is it like enforced? Like like a sedition act, 
it's not always. We'll come to it. Good question. We're jumping the gun. There will be a court case. Yes. It only applies to war, but define war. The law says war. And we have not, the United States has not declared war since World War II. <laughs> so, but, but are we at war now? You see, the, it's, a, it's such a big rare. So, with that, let me get to the, this is a big deal. So a couple of posters. I like this one. Civilians, right to soldiers. Good one? You like that one? It's kind of creepy. And then, okay. Here are posters to convince people to join the Navy and Marines, done by the same artist who had a massive, he had a crush on this model. There's no doubt. There's like 10 more with her. And it's not subtle. Well, what does it say to men? If you resist joining or enlisting, what are you? Not a real man. I have that one up here. Is this one just hand? Gee, I wish you were a man, I'd join the Navy. And, okay, this is slightly different than the I want you with Uncle Sam, isn't it? It's a different message. If you don't understand the message, just go out your healthy. But, <laughs> no, and think about it for a second. Isn't that funny, though? I mean, it's not subtle at all. Yes, of course, she's going to date you. No! But... <laughs> <laughs> yes, they will court. I know it. All right, moving on. But what was she was sunk in 1915 off of Ireland? That's 1918. That's still talking lucidity. That's graphic. Belgium, this is 1918. And that's not subtle at all either, is it? We know exactly what they're implying with that. Without a doubt. And so it works. It's very effective. Oh, so we gotta get is the phone ready to ring? Yeah. Let me just explain this real fast then. War madness. War madness. We get war madness now. War madness would sweep through and this kind of just fervor to find the enemy. Once you convince people we need to be scared of Germans, and they start looking out for themselves. And they started to, well, first off, this don't talk. Spies are listening. The hell of the Kaiser. Are you an American? Prove it. And then look at these German atrocities like blood sausage and Limburger cheese. Sauerkraut. German, German dachshund. Now, a couple things about this. It became a matter of war madness. If people had dogs like that, a lot of them had their dogs killed. They just put them. Yeah, they would find them hanging. Wait, wait, wait. They called them victory pups. Frankfurters became hot dogs. Sauerkraut became victory cabbage. Hamburgers became Salisbury steak. War cabbage. And if you had a German sounding name, watch your back. What's a German name? Better change it to what's a good English name. Um, that's my mom's name. <laughs> she has three great grandparents and one friend together. I'm going to go on the game. Okay. What? So, yeah. And then she didn't change her name when she married my dad. So, she was a lot of fun. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> that's very good. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to lie. You have to present. For me? <laughs> Yeah, I, like, right there, Is it your birthday? I'm 
Yeah. Where are you going? Where are you going? She it's just like you guys are politically involved in your shoot point. Yeah. Yeah. We're good? Cool. Okay. Uh, we're going to do Dylan's part of the meeting tomorrow. And then on Wednesday, I'm going to go down to the podcast. Oh, we got to have to dress up tomorrow. Hey. So we're actually going to address the dates here. You don't want to tell them to say it, right? So we're going to be hanging out. Listen, 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 Hey, by the way, that's Europe. That's my, uh... Europe is very big on the world. Why didn't you tell Europe for us? They didn't even get as far as me. You know, no, they were a little behind. Well, I drew Europe. Yeah. No, I actually had a couple issues with somebody missed the deep. And so, and... Yeah. So, they're a little behind, but we'll catch up. Where's Albania? Uh, is That's Macedonia. I'm good with it. Where's Liechtenstein? Where's Spain? We're waving to each other. Hey, hey, do you want to hold hands later? No. Are you sure? Yeah. That's Sounds like change your mind. Okay, I will. I got Portugal, I have Andorra. I'm going to go to Andorra. Hmm? I see Russia. Oh. Andorra? Look at this map. It's cool. Why are you who else wants to go to Andorra? No lifting sign yet. parts of it are really cool. You know what they Stalinist architecture. Except for their monuments. Their monuments for the Soviet Union were pretty cool. All right, so we still have a couple presentations to go through. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so besides Grace, I think that's it, right? Grace is the last one. Oh, so why? We expect a lot of it. Has anyone ever seen what works moving in? Hayden's making up movies. All right, so we have one more presentation, but we also should have our assignment. I don't think I collected that because we literally ended like two minutes after. Yeah, two minutes, yeah, yeah, two minutes after the bell. <laughs> yeah. I touched one more room. You know, if you're going to make up a movie, have actors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm with the Kevin Thompson. All right. Any questions on the assignment? I know the bell rang. The bell rang, but. If I do something like that, I'll wing them at somebody. Not on purpose, just I'll be waving my arms and that's you know. I've done that with pins, I'll have pins for life. So, for the untouchable, why do they show Ellie and Ness?
as this almost saintly character. Combination of the eating hero and what's the other thing? A hero, what's that? So you want a good guy and a bad guy, right? And what else, Brian? And communism, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the other thing is, when they do something like that, think about it. Here he was, he was going to do everything by the book. What did he say when they when he got into that uh, snow plow? He was going to go through into the... Well, how, I said that, I think once. But, it's good to be married. Huh? It's good to be married. He did say it's good to be married to the guy when they're at, he's having his sandwich. But he also said... Let's do some good. That's me. Thank you. Okay. He said, you know, let's do some good. But then he was this clean cut police officer that you cannot bribe. Okay. He was this clean cut policeman you cannot bribe. And what did he do? Did he bribe? Did he get bribed? He didn't take the bribe. That's the thing. What he had to break rule. What rules did he break? He killed that guy. He killed the man. He they searched that place. They they went to the first place. They had the, the hidden uh, warehouse in the post office. He went in there. His men, yeah, no, nothing. They just did. They barged in. No real evidence of anything except for the fact that somebody said that. And what did they do when they walked in? What did they do to that guy who eventually learned up learned about baseball? <laughs> yeah, he got assaulted. Police brutality. Yeah. Yeah, they were allowed to go with the police, but were not allowed to arrest him. What was he doing? He's shooting police out there with a shotgun at the train station. <laughs> By the way, wasn't that that was an impressive scene, wasn't it? How many people thought the baby was going to get? Yeah, I like it. Well, no, hey, you grew up in Chicago. Yeah. So you have to explain what parts, what, how they use, how they use real, um, what's, what parts are true, which parts are false. I don't know. You have to read the book. Back to look some stuff up. There's a lot of things that are really untrue. But it's it's a good entertaining movie, has all there's elements of truth, but the untouchables were not like that. The untouchables were a large group of some treasury, some police. They were given that name, but most of them were drunkards. You know, they drank. The whole thing about family, nah, you know. And the other things about it, it wasn't through the untouchables at all how Al Capone got fingered. It was another, basically it was just hardworking accountants where they got it. But they made it part of this big thing with L.A. and Mass. No. How about that little um, incident in the courtroom where they started yelling at each other at the end? You think that was true? No. No. But it was true about the jury when it was trial. The jury were bought off. That is true. How did Nitty die again? Where? Yeah, in a rail yard. No, he's, he's in the car. He died just in the movie. So, was there a lot of good cop, bad cop things? I like movies like that. It's got a little bit of a morality play, but it plays on great American. Stereotypes, this myth about dangers, and just the element of truth. And I'm not kidding, um, I did look it up. Less than four weeks after shooting this movie, Robert De Niro lost 80 pounds. I mean, I, I've lost 100 in a week. But... <laughs> <laughs> Clean living. I Okay, that there's an element of truth. He did have somebody killed. Right. But not. That sounded be pretty true. And that was a violent world. That was 
I think there would be, I, was he making a, a statement to the others? <laughs> Don't get caught. <laughs> Did you like the movie? Yes. All right. Make sure your name's on, turn that in. If you want to get a little bit of time to finish up your short ID, go ahead. I enjoy that movie, even though Kevin Costner is, uh, it's Kevin Costner. Oh, oh, and one more thing. During Racketeer Rabbit, what do you suppose was Bugs' main motivation? It was just an insane rabbit. Yes, he was insane. But what did that do with, think about it, done during the war. Prohibition is done. Yet, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Did you like Rabbit Deer Rabbit? Should we watch? We should watch yeah. Duck Rabbit Duck. Oh. We should watch that. I like the one with the opera doc. What's opera doc? Yes. You know, I, I don't think I did it for you guys in the AP Euro, but I did show what's opera. What's op no, no, I used to show that in Western Civ, but I thought it wasn't. Uh, yeah. What's opera doc? I'm sorry, what's opera doc? Because it has all the Wagner. Oh, it's like Chuck Jones' Oh, that would be cool. Yeah, it was awesome. Oh, that would be awesome. Where was it at? Minneapolis at the History Museum. He's one of the big directors of the uh, Disney series. What are you doing classes? I still did one. I don't like I don't like You've never seen one? Huh? I don't like the movie you said. They're awesome! What's the most like? Yeah, we just talked about that. Let's offer Doc. How dare you? No, it's all Wagner. Remember Wagner? Did I show you about Doc? All right, so we have one more presentation to do. And since I have nothing else planned, Grace has got a lot So I hope you're ready. And then we'll talk about dress, okay? You ready? Yeah. Uh, it's really dark here. So much, well, we're going to watch something on Dillinger. So let me find your presentation. What should I teach next year? Uh, AP literature. <laughs> <laughs> Could I? Here I have like. I probably have one. Oh, enough. a new background. background. Yeah, I put Paul McCartney in New York. I thought he was dead. And he died back in 66. That's fake Paul in New York. Oh, we love Paul. 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 Pa